All right, so what I wanted to, uh, uh, to do uh, today is, uh, is to talk a little bit about uh, academic uh, writing. Of course, that's a skill that we all need and we all use all the time. I know that by now that has changed compared to maybe 20 years ago. Most people have uh, followed the course on, uh, on academic writing, so uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. But there are still a number of things that I would like to go through. I think it's once in a while interesting to, to go through these uh, things uh, again. And so that's what I'd like to, uh, to discuss uh, today. So I'd like to start with the three key principles of, of academic writing. Uh, communication, communication, communication. Right. Really, and this is really important because I think that's, that's really the... Uh, um, the, the most dangerous thing is that they are actually in the scientific community, there is actually a lot of uh, bad writing. I'll uh, touch upon it of where that could be uh, uh, coming from. But for me, I take, it's one of the few issues I take no prisoners. You write to be understood, right? So, so we want to actually have some idea in our head and actually try to push oops, back. Uh, as much as possible of our message uh, to, to our readers, okay? And so the, uh, <clears throat> the big risk is that we actually try to, to write to, to demonstrate mastery to impress uh, other people, to impress the reviewers, because there I think that there is really a, a real difficulty that is that, yes, we go through the reviewing process and we have to convince the reviewers that we know stuff that nobody else knows. And I think that interferes uh, quite a bit actually with the quality of our writing. We, we try to, to appear uh, smart. We are afraid uh, uh, to actually say things simply because if we say things simply, we, we would fear that, yeah, everybody would say it's trivial. And maybe to some extent, that's, that's a real risk. I, I won't, don't want to downplay that. I think that that varies a little bit when you go through the review process, you might meet reviewers that will actually value the fact that they see a piece of work and they actually understand quite a bit of what's written in there. Uh, and you'll have others who will say, yeah, if I understand, it can't be that interesting. Okay. And I'm not sure exactly, you know, I only have my own experience as a reviewer, also as a, uh, as a chair of, of, of review panels, because of, for example, it's, ECCB and ISMB have, have chaired really large review processes with, with hundreds of, of submissions. But really like there we have a, a bit of a tension that we need to, to acknowledge. But I think for me, it's, it's very, very clear. We need to write things, we need to write them simply in an understandable manner so that the great ideas that we have, they actually go across at least part of it. I mean, we acknowledge that well. A few reviewers will understand every single thing that we wanted to, to, to say. It's not just me saying that. I, I was, uh, I'll show a small fragment of a video. I think you see the parallel with the, our task to get papers through reviewers. We believe are so much smarter than we are, except that we also are the reviewers, but eventually they get to decide whether our paper makes it through or not. And so we want to, to show that we know so many things. So <clears throat> there's a few books out there that you could actually look at. Uh, so the, the, the oldest one is a, a very classical text. It's called The Elements of Style. It's really a key reference in English. It's a short uh, book. It's really about writing in English in general. Okay. And then you have a one that is really uh, uh, probably my favorite for, for us. Uh, it's, it's more focused towards mathematics. So it's really about also how you write equations and things like that. But it's on book of, Handbook of Writing for the Mathematical Sciences. I think everybody you know, who's serious about writing a math paper should uh, uh, read that, uh, 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 that book. Uh, one of my favorite, but it's hard to find these days is Bugs in Writing. It's less of really like a cookbook. It's, it's more a number of, of elements in writing that the, that the author says you need to, to pay attention to. And uh, there the goal is more to learn to develop an ear. So work on so many texts that after a while you kind of hear, hear sorry, whether this sounds good or, or, or that doesn't. 
And then if you really fall in love with writing, then there is the Chicago Manual of Style, where once you start worrying about, you know, how do you handle quotes inside quotes, is that single quotes instead of, uh, inside of double quotes, or is it the other way around? And there you go to the Chicago Manual of Style. I think most of us don't, don't really need that uh, uh, too much. So <laughs> maybe when, when you see me work on, on, the, on the manuscript, you may you're, yeah, wondering, you know, what, why is Eve always, you know, working on, on the commas and, and, and on, you know, really small details in, in, in the text. Uh, and, and that's because I, I believe that there is a way to, to actually write to optimize communication. So when we, in English in particular, this is very well developed. So if you take other languages, for example, French is really quite a horrible language because from a tradition back to the time of Louis the 14th and so on, French is really about impressing other people a lot. But in English, there is really a tradition of writing to communicate. And so that they have worked on this for decades and really I mean, more, more than a century, really in details, trying to see how we can arrange things to communicate in a, an efficient way. Meaning, what does that mean? Is we try to make the writing predictable. Okay. So, so when you see a, a, a a period at a certain place, it has a certain meaning. And the next time you see it in the same context, it will have the same meaning. Uh, if you have, let's say, you know, you'd learn the difference between a, a, an, a, an N dash and an M dash, you know, why do we have a slightly larger dash when you have a compound that's made out of two nouns that are balanced, for example, these are small details, you know, most of us will not worry about uh, 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 that. But these are, are made to communicate details of, of information. And so just changing the form, for example, really already affects how uh, uh, the message is brought across. Okay, so, the, so we don't want to spend too much time focusing on the form of the message. We want the form of the message to kind of disappear in the background so that we can accumulate the information you know, on the fly as, uh, uh, as we read and really focus much more on the uh, content. So if you have like, you know, uh, uh, unusual, uh, uh, for example, typographical patterns, let's say I'm a French speaker. So I put a space before a semicolon and a space before uh, a question mark or an explanation, uh, exclamation mark. Well, that to an English speaker is a minor distraction. Of course, you have that all across the flow of your entire uh, paper. And so basically you can really, by following a style, it's not just the typographical uh, details, it's actually many aspects, we'll cover several of those. You can really re uh, lower the burden of actually uh, <clears throat> acquiring the, uh, the form of the message so that you can actually uh, uh, get uh, qu more quickly to the content of the message. Now there are writing styles, there are full books, you there are plenty of rules, you know, it's a couple of hundred rules. Uh, so it's, it's for many people, it might not be the most exciting thing. And, and you're not going to be a great writer by applying a writing style, you know, systematically. Okay. But if you do that, you'll, you'll be a clear writer. Okay. Maybe, you know, this is not made to write novels. It's made to, to actually communicate scientific, academic information. So, you know, flourishing your, your text is, is not the goal. Okay. Uh, of course, you know, to be able to do that, your mastery of English should be sufficient. So, you know, if you still struggle, uh, well, take a few more classes and, and until you feel at least, it, it, you know, it's natural based on our different backgrounds. You know, it's not as easy for everyone to, to learn English. It's, it's easier for those who speak a Germanic language, and it's a lot harder for those who, who speak a non-European uh, language. So, but there's not much you can do. It takes time, and as you improve, then you can start focusing on those aspects. Because if you struggle with just you know the basics of the writing, you know, like 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 how to conjugate a, a verb and stuff like that, yeah, then you that that's really above above what you can achieve. All right, so. Yeah, writing style is not a, a, a science, so there is no consensus on, on all the details of, of style. Okay, so uh, and and there is it will never it will never occur. I think 
I mean, at least in English, you definitely already have the split between US English and UK English. That's not going to go uh, uh, away. And you have like different levels, OK? You, I would say you have the general writing style, so that's in, in, in English, uh, in our case. Uh, so for me, I use US English. I'll talk about that a bit later. I use something called the serial comma, and I use something called the closed punctuation. I will explain what all that is. So, so that's why you see me adding commas when I correct your, your uh, uh, or I work on your text, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, and you can really worry, wonder, you know, why, why do you spend your time doing that? Well, because I, I want to have a nice piece of text that, that uh, is easy, even for a native speaker to read. Then you have the editorial style, which can be basically against even your general writing style, when you write for a certain journal, they will have a style guide and they will say, this is how we do it. So for example, you might have a journal that says, we don't use the serial comma. Okay, and then you might say, okay, gosh, now I have to remove all my commas before the ends. I'll, I'll show that in a moment. And then you have your own style because not every single element is determined by the uh, general writing style or the editorial style. It's if there is also what you, you set up, okay? so. It, showed here for example yeah like just bullets well you need to be consistent so there there are two mistakes i change the bullets uh, on the, at the top level and i make a bigger bullet at the lower level well that needs to be corrected okay now this is small but you have to multiply that by you know one of these things every every five words and so that that starts to to win it's not the the, the largest uh, burden we'll see uh, later uh, what's what's actually more more challenging? Now we do have LaTeX and we have Overleaf, and I think for us has been really good in the past few years. I think we, everybody uses Overleaf here. You you don't? Not really. We just yeah like yeah that's okay. <laughs> but I had an account because of <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. All right. So so in the past. Uh, when we were working even more closely with the biologists, we had to deal with a lot of word manuscripts, which are a nightmare, absolute nightmare. There is no excuse for for the pain that 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 word is inflicting upon the world because because we know how to do that right. So basically, uh, <clears throat> LaTeX is a a document markup uh, uh, language where you tag parts of of your text with a certain meaning. So so when you have the heading of a section, you say that's a section heading. It's a section. When you have an equation, you say it's an equation. When when you want to emphasize, well, that's not quite the same thing as putting something in bold, for example, or in italics. And you'd have to know, okay, what what is that I want to do now? Do I want to tag as emphasize or do I want to tag as italics? At that level, people start not to be necessarily always 100 uh, percent coherent. The huge advantage is that when you do that markup, <coughs> as we do in, in Overleaf, then there's all kinds of aspects that are immediately covered. You get the beautiful uh, fonts, you get the systematic, you know, you decide whether or not to number your uh, sections and subsections. And when you have decided that, they're all consistently uh, numbered. Okay. Uh, in Word, sometimes you, you, you say, how is it? possible that this thing does not want to behave as I want to behave. In a bulleted list, you know, it's like one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, and you have to spend five minutes figuring out how am I going to correct that so that I get one, two, three, four, five, six for my bullets. That never happens in, in LaTeX and Overleaf is a, is a web-based uh, system <coughs> um, that allows us to, to actually uh, have a, um, almost what you see is what you get feeling in, in LaTeX. So I think, you know, we didn't have Overleaf like seven years ago, so it's not that old. And uh, well, we could do it before. I mean, we could use LaTeX, but Overleaf, I used Lix before, but uh, Overleaf has been a real uh, improvement. All right. So <clears throat> a number of, of uh, core elements in, in writing. So first of all, you don't write everything in passive voice, okay? You might think, you might have been told that this is how you do it, but that's not, okay? And among, in academia, you meet most scientists who would think that, yes, you start by a passive voice and then move on until the end of your manuscript and you never ever write we or 
anything like that. Well, no, that's that's uh, bad writing. You want actually very active, punchy writing. So you don't want some sentence like, it's widely believed that the use of the passive voice is required in academic writing. It's better to say, write in the active voice, okay? Because, because that's much easier to understand, okay? And you may think that by writing a difficult sentence like that, you will sound smarter, maybe, but certain, that, that's not completely obvious. If you go and watch further the, the video I, I, I showed, uh, um, actually this, this is being disputed that actually people who write clearly are being considered to produce better uh, work. But I think it's, it's still a matter of, of debate. You want to be precise. So who did what, where, how, to whom, so you want, when you write stuff, you want to avoid staying vague, you know, whenever you write it and this, you have to really worry, okay, do, does the person read know what it is or what this is? Okay, so for example, I often remove this and I replace it by actually what this is supposed uh, to be. You don't have to ban completely the passive voice. I'm a bit harsh on, on, on that one, but I, I looked uh, today again at, Nicholas Iams uh, writing and he balances, okay? So you don't want to also have we, 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 we in every single sentence because for five pages that gets uh, uh, tiring. So you have to find a balance. And there you have to develop a skill of, of uh, rewriting. So of course you will start with your own habits of, of writing. Uh, so in this article, a novel machine learning method is presented. And then you'd have to make a conscious effort to for example, right in this article, we present a new machine learning method, or this article presents a new machine learning method. And basically, when you simplify, you know, there is more punch, there is more action in your writing. Of course, you know, you have a certain way of writing naturally, you, as you were trained for many years. And so, of course, doing this in every single sentence of a manuscript can be, it can be tiring. You have to find a balance. I mean, you, what you want in the end is, is that somebody picks your article and that if they have the proper background, that they can read it quite quickly without, without effort trying to understand what it is that, that uh, uh, you wanted to say without using you know, um, magnifying glasses to check you know, the caption of your figures. You, you want to tell things to, to people. So, so when you keep that in mind, uh, it's, you always move forward quite nicely. So here, that's from the book of, of Haim. Uh, and you can see, like in the passive voice, you would really uh, think this is the kind of thing that people would, would write. Okay. The answer was provided to 16 decimal places by Gaussian elimination. You don't have to write it in the passive voice. Uh, Gaussian elimination gave the answer to 16 decimal places, work actually better. It's easier to read. Okay. Also, when you write a passive voice, uh, you, you have to wonder about who did the action, because in the passive voice, you know, something happens to the, the answer, and that becomes the subject of your sentence. But normally, you, you uh, indeed, you need by caution elimination. Okay. You typically will forget about the by, and then you will be missing an important piece of information. So quite often, when you have a passive sentence, if you don't have a by, you have to worry what should come there, who did the thing. And once you know, you can rewrite it in the active voice. Okay. And the other examples are, are on the same uh, line. Uh, you want to be concise, all right? So we tend to uh, worry about, will my, my text will be long enough? So we tend to get wordy quite quickly. I'm a bit wordy by, by nature. Um, Actually, it, it, it's okay to, to start making your text shorter by taking all kinds of stuff that doesn't really need to be there. Okay, so even in the sentences before, okay, uh, it's attributed to the fact, uh, things like that, these are like longish stuff uh, that you could actually get rid of. Okay, um, so, so we tend to, to write long stuff and actually they have plenty of elements that are like fillers. It's, it's a bit, in your writing, it's a bit like when you talk and, and I say uh, 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 all the time, because at some point I'm looking for my words, so I kind of fill. Well, in writing, we do similar things, 
we add like fillers. Uh, and so this is a short list, but actually the list is much, much longer. Uh, I couldn't find a really comprehensive list because I think that's really uh, uh, interesting. Uh, these are all kind of stuff that actually don't really bring information to your sentence. They sound a little nice, but, but uh, when you start tying this together along your, your text, it actually makes your text a lot heavier. And so this is an example of, of um, uh, elements that you can simply replace. So what's between the, the brackets is uh, uh, what you can replace that by, all right? And if it's an X, it means you just get rid of it. Okay. Actually, you know, there's very few sentences where you know, actually is really necessary, you just get rid of it. You haven't lost anything really meaningful in your, uh, uh, in your sentence. In fact, uh, it's another example, okay? So, and you may, think, okay, but, you know, if I write only with simple words, you know, I'll sound, I'll sound stupid, but, but it's, it's not quite true. Where you can actually uh, uh, try to use uh, words that are more, uh, uh, that are richer is, is what I call specific uh, uh, words. Uh, I, I use the example of the, of the uh, Monty Python sketch of the, the bridge of death. I'm not sure if your own uh, old enough to, to know about the Monty Python, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> so you want to use the simplest term that carries your the meaning that you want to bring across. Okay? But you want to be as specific as uh, as needed. Okay? So so here yeah, there is a bird. It's a, it's an African uh, uh, swallow, and you would want to talk about the the speed of the bird. Well, if you're talking about uh, uh, not just a bird, but a swallow, say a swallow. If you're talking about an African swallow and not other swallows, say African swallow. If you talk about Petrochelidon spilodera, then say so. So use the most specific word that is relevant for what you're really trying to say. So there is space for technical terms when the meaning you're trying to bring across is that okay so so you don't have to replace every single thing by a simple word when you want to say this thing and that's the name of that thing and that name is a bit longish because yeah that's how we call these things uh you need to be uh specific yeah there there's a place for being specific you know the a certain algorithm has a certain name and you need to use its name if that's what you're talking about certain method you know technical terms biological terms okay do we have to say Petrokeli Don Spilodera or uh, uh, South African cliff swallow. Yeah, so it's probably we used to be a little pedantic and we prefer using that if you're a biologist, but that doesn't matter too much. It's also what you can expect people who read your, your article to understand easily. Okay, so, so of course, not everyone is going to read your, your text. Your text is as a certain audience. And you can make some assumptions about what you think that most of the audience will, will know and be familiar with. Okay. So there will be some, uh, some terms that you say, well, you know, if you don't know that term, then probably that paper is not, not really for you. If you do it properly, well, you know, don't start using a, an abbreviation without having given what the abbreviation, abbreviation was, because you see that sometimes you have a paper and not only are they using the abbreviation all across the text, but they're not even telling you what the abbreviation is, which would be a small you know, effort uh, uh, to make. Then you, when you write your, your, your text, you want to actually structure it. And you know, that, that's not what I wanted to really uh, go into uh, uh, today. But what's really important is to actually, you know, each paragraph has one uh, core idea. And then within that idea, you want to structure it. And then from one paragraph to the next, you want to structure it. So you need to have all kinds of linking words. These are cheap, they're short, and they actually uh, help the reader navigate uh, what you're, you're seeing. And there's a, you know, there is quite a few of, of, of those. So for example, I tend to get stuck with further, further more and, and, and moreover, but there's actually more uh, 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 synonyms of, of that, okay? So, it's really different uh, uh, elements, but what you want is, is really to structure, to imagine a little bit that your text also has a, 
a graphical structure of the core ideas that you want to bring across, even though you don't, you know, you're not going to start writing by making a, a graph of actually all the ideas that you want to, to say, at least that's not how I do, uh, but uh, uh, you want to organize those in a way that, that uh, it doesn't become a, a laundry list of statements. I mean, the, if you don't use linking words after a while, uh, the reader will get lost because it's one thing after another, after another, after another. There's, there's quite a few of, of those. All right. So also, and this, this gets a little harder. Uh, uh, it's, it's how do we confuse the reader without us realizing that we are confusing the reader? Okay, so there's here as a, a few elements, but basically when we write the stuff we want to write, we know the stuff. I mean, we, have, we haven't forgotten about it. You know, it's, it's very hard to, for, for example, when you reread your own uh, uh, writing, it really takes a while before you can actually read it as if, as if someone else had, had written it. You know, if, if I write it today and then I, I reread it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, actually the ideas are still there and I might not see that some ideas are, are unclear because I know what I'm talking about. So in one core example are, are pronouns. So often it's just not very clear what, what it, uh, this, uh, um, uh, even he, the, she, they, what, what this is really talking about. Okay, you can really get lost. So uh, I'm gonna give a couple examples. Usually, of course, the reader can disambiguate that by actually resolving uh, uh, the, the piece of text and, and making a, an indicated guess about what, what you really made, uh, meant, okay? So after putting the disc in the cabinet, Mabel sold it. Is it the cabinet or is it the disc that was, was sold? So usually the pronoun will refer to the uh, closest word uh, before it, that matches it. Okay, so so if uh, after putting the discs in the cabinet, Mabel sold them, then you would know that it's a disc. It cannot be the cabinet because the disc was not plural. But here it's a singular. So normally it's probably the cabinet. But if you intend to say that it's actually the disc that was uh, uh, being sold, then then you have a problem because your sentence it will be really hard to parse for, for the, the reader, okay? Uh, <clears throat> similarly to too many, what is that called, antecedents? So take the radio out of the car and fix it. Wow, probably fixing the radio, 80% and maybe 20% is about fixing the car. I don't know, they have to make a guess or 90, 10. My guess would be that if you take the radio out of the car, and fix it, it's probably the radio that you're fixing. Okay. But that, that suddenly creates a cognitive load on your reader for stuff that there's really no reason for the reader to have to think about that. Okay. And of course, the reader will not, will not really think about, okay, uh, even the, the reader might not even think, what does the author mean here? The, the reader will just be a little bit confused. Okay. We'll, we'll move on and, and will not really be sure what was meant. And you can, you can fix this easily. Okay, take the radio out of the car and fix the radio, take the radio out of the car and fix the car. Often, you, I think that what happens is that people don't like to repeat the same word too close by. And so they prefer using a pronoun, but if there is a, a chance of, of confusion, you know, it's better to repeat now. Sometimes the, the, the thing that's being referred to is actually not quite where, where it should be. So, so the candy dish was empty, but we were tired of eating it anyway. Eating the dish or eating the candy, well, you can of course parse it and say, well, it's probably not eating the dish, it's probably eating the candy, so you can resolve it. But again, it uses you know, brain cycles where there is really no, uh, uh, no reason. And it can get even worse that you know, because you write this, so you know what, what you want to say, all right? So the, the witness called the television, television station, but they didn't answer. 
when you wrote that, you knew what, what you meant. I mean, the, the reporters didn't answer, okay? But of course, and okay, the witness called the television station, but they didn't answer. Again, the reader will kind of figure it out, okay? The television station, there are many people there, so it's the people of the television station, but you can fix it easily. <clears throat> and so unload all that unnecessary cognitive load from uh, your uh, reader. And sometimes it can be really like, you know, you can land in situations where simply the reader will not know what you meant. Uh, you can also get uh, a confusion. This is a, uh, <coughs> a structure that people also like to uh, use uh, a lot to sound uh, sophisticated is rather than making a straight sentence to take a part of it and put it in back in the front. Okay, so this is the, you have the dang, dangling participles and dangling infinitives. So here, screaming in pain, the nurse quickly wrapped her arms around the child. It's probably not the, the nurse that is screaming in pain, it's, it's, it's the child, okay? So when you have a, a, a fragment uh, like this one that's screaming in pain, um, basically what follows needs to tell you who is screaming in pain. It gives you the subject of of that, uh, of that uh, fragment, okay? And uh, if there you put the nurse, well, that's not the subject that is actually screaming in pain, it's the child, right? So yeah, if you simply wrote the nurse quickly wrapped her arms around the screaming child, you'd be done. And that, that second sentence is, is, is a totally straightforward. It tells exactly what you want to, uh, to carry across. Uh, and same thing with infinitives. We do a lot of you know these two sentences, two blah blah, blah. and basically you get the normally well, no, not normally after a two fragments. What comes here is the subject of that fragment. So of course it's not the headlights that avoid an accident while driving at night. It's a driver that uh, that uh, uh, avoids an accident while driving at night by turning the uh, headlights on. And if you just brought the two fragment back at the back, you probably wouldn't be hurting anyone. The driver should always turn the headlights on to avoid an accident while driving at night. There's nothing really wrong with that. Okay. So I think that when we, we write like that, it's, it's to sound sophisticated. But uh, for uh, most of us, we're not even native speakers. Well, you know, this is, this is out of our league. So I think it's, it's better to play safe. And if you hear, not only have an infinitive phrase, but you start actually putting a passive voice here, you're screwed, okay? It's, it gets impossible to know who's doing what. So. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, tenses is also, that's a hard one uh, because we work on manuscripts uh, at different times with different people. And we, I think we never really make an agreement before we start manuscript. Are we going to write this in the present tense, in the past tense, uh, um, in the present perfect? And basically, we start getting pieces from everyone. And then we have some present, some past, some uh, present perfect. Um, and so that's not how it's supposed to be. So you, should, you, you make a choice. You say, OK, I'm going to write it in the present. Often we prefer to write it in the past because again, probably to sound a little smarter. Uh, that's okay, there's nothing really wrong with that, uh, but, but you need to be consistent. So well, when it doesn't work is, you know, I, oh, I write that paragraph, you write that paragraph, and nobody really realizes what's going on. Then actually you have to go through, and, and that is really hard to fix, okay? Because going through a whole manuscript and figuring out wherever the use of the tense is wrong, and of course, when it's just you know, present and past, that's still kind of okay, but when you start having sentences where basically you refer to stuff that happened even before, uh, and you have to be a little more careful about your use of tenses, that that becomes really tough. So uh, I, I would say, you know, like make a choice. So I'm not sure that will really happen, but I would say when when you start you contribute to a manuscript, look first what the initial contribution how it was written. And if it's coherent, you know, just follow that. If it's not coherent, well, then go back to the people and say, okay, what are we doing here?
Then we have uh, British versus US spelling. Uh, it's not a huge deal. Uh, tumor, tumor, analyze, analyze, modeling, modeling. Uh, it gets messy very quick. Okay. So, so I, I, I would say, you know, our writing is dominated by, by US you know, uh, spelling. Uh, because you know, a lot of papers are written in the US spelling. So unless you're a native uh, English speaker from Britain, or you know you did your PhD in England and you learned to write properly in British English, I would say stick to the, the US spelling. Even in high, if in high school you learn in British English, you will, you will mess that up everywhere. Yeah. And what about data sets? Because there is also US data sets. It's yeah, yeah. So that's a, I, I prefer to write data sets in two words, but you know, I had a discussion with uh, with Edward during his uh, in, in his PhD manuscript about that. Um and that one is is actually shifting to become uh, a single word. Okay. So database, there is actually an entry in the dictionary. Database is a word in the English dictionary. Therefore, we don't write it in two words. Data sets, it's not a word in the uh, uh, English dictionary, but for example, in Wikipedia, I think that it's actually written in one word. So I think that there, of course, languages changes over time. And I don't like it, okay? But uh, you know, so we had a discussion and Edward insisted and said, yeah, but you know, I prefer data set in one word. And then I looked it up and I said, okay, well, yeah, that seems to be a trend. And uh, all right, so that, 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 that's acceptable. So, so again, this is, yeah, there are preferences, there are habits, they're not homogeneous. So, so what you cannot do, what you cannot do is write half of the time data sets in two words and half of the time data sets in one word and the third half with a, with a, a, a dash in between. That, that doesn't work. Okay, so, so consistency is also that, 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 that trumps a bit everything. So if you've said, this is how I'm going to do it, and you do it everywhere in the same way, that's much more acceptable than if you start to be inconsistent. Then there is the serial comma, which is, a, again, also a nightmare. It's just a convention, and people will, will uh, so there was a, a so quote, like a, 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 a never start a, a conversation between people who are for or against the serial comma. Uh, if anybody has had a drink, because it's going to end really bad. Okay, so what's a serial comma? That means that in a sequence of several terms, if you write A, B, C, and D, uh, before the last end, before the end, uh, A and D, you put a comma. Okay, and if you say that, that, that no serial comma, then you actually don't put a comma before the end. Okay? And people will discuss about that for for hours and hours, whether it's better one or the other. By now we know that there's actually no, no better way. So basically uh, most UK spelling, although it's called the, also the Oxford comma. So the Oxford style is actually using the serial comma, but mostly in the UK, you do not use the serial comma. In the US, you typically use the serial comma. Therefore I use the, the uh, serial comma. It doesn't solve anything, okay? so. Here is an example I found. Uh, so you can create ambiguity by actually not having the comma. So, so uh, if you write to my parents, comma, and Rand and God, that's a fake dedication of a, of a book. Well, that can be read as that your parents are in Rand and God. Okay. Uh, uh, but if you use the serial comma and you write to my mother, comma, in Rand, comma, and God, well, uh, is do you mean that you dedicate the book to your mother, to Ayn Rand and to God, or do you mean that you dedicate it to your mother, who is Ayn Rand and to God? So there's actually, you can even have cases that will be ambiguous uh, 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 whether or not you use the zero comma. So, so it doesn't solve anything. It's just, the thing is that you're not supposed to, you know, have uh, half of the places in your text where you don't use a zero comma and the other half where you do. That's a very hard one. And I try to, Add serial commas everywhere, but you know, I, if I catch three quarters, that, that 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 that's good because it's really hard to catch every single one. There's no, I don't have like a command that you can say, okay, run this and find me all the potential serial commas and and replace maybe with a smart uh, um, regular expression. You could do that. 
But again, this is this is a, a, a convention. So we need to agree on that. And that's why I say, well, you know, my style is, is, is this one. It's US spelling is the zero comma. Uh, and then you also have open and closed punctuation. So, um, so what does that mean? Uh, in open punctuation, you don't start putting commas and, 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 uh, and semicolon everywhere. Because, because those, again, they, they, they cost a little bit. I mean, every time you meet a comma, that costs a little bit of cognitive effort. Uh, of course, you put it there because it will structure things. It will, it will tell you, you know, and something is between two commas, it will tell you, oh, what you're adding there, that's, that's extra information. If you, if you don't put the commas around it, you'll have to parse it and know, oh, that part of the sentence is actually non-essential. When you put it between commas, you know uh, that it's, it's not essential. So again, this is not something that is, is totally clear cut. Um, when you have a really good writer uh, who doesn't make sentences that are too heavy and that flow really nicely, a good writer will be able to bounce around and not add commas everywhere to actually kind of draw. It's, it's, it's a bit like you're making a drawing on your sentence to say, this part is this and this part is that. You know, it just flows through. Um, I'm not I'm not a fantastic writer, so I prefer the close punctuation. I feel safer uh, with that, and I'll say this is part is non-essential. I'll put it between commas. Uh, uh, this part is like an addition, so I might use a, an m dash, a, a long one, to say that this is an extra piece that, that you add. I might sometimes use a semicolon. My writing is not particularly light. I mean, it's I, I know that, but I write in a somewhat you know stilted manner, so like a bit stiff. Uh, manner, but that you know, it, uh, at least I think it's well structured and it's clear, and uh, uh, it really depends on how gifted you are with with writing. Some people are much more gifted, and when they write stuff, it feels you can hear the music, and uh, well, not everybody has that. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, which versus that are also called correct or a lot. So, which uh, so uh, indicates an, an optional clause that can be removed without affecting the meaning of the rest of the sentence, and you need to always put a comma before it, okay? and that specifies it gives you a, a information that specifies the noun that is before it, and it cannot be removed without altering the meaning of the sentence, and there you don't put a comma before. It, okay, so so when it's which or that with a cross, you have to say okay which. That needs to be a comma before that no comma is it essential it should be that is it uh, uh, additional information it should be which and there will be situations where you'll have to decide whether you think that the fragment there is essential or or it's uh, 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 more uh, additional information it's not always clear cut whether it needs to be that or or needs to be which the test is really quite simple you take the thing you take it out and you say okay how much about lost of the information of the sentence. And if you feel, okay, you lost too much, then it should be that. If you say, yeah, that was just, you know, additional detail, then it should be which. All right, so now we can already conclude. Uh, so for me, you know, what I'm really uh, wondering what it's really what's coming next. I mean, I, I, I tried ChatGPT on some pieces of text and you can ask it to, to edit text. And, and it's, it's pretty good. It's really pretty good at that job. So um, there will be a discussion in the academic community about what is acceptable, not acceptable. I think Nature already came with an editorial saying that it will not accept material generated by ChatGPT. I don't think that editing your text with ChatGPT is actually generating your text via ChatGPT. Yeah. So maybe this tool can add serial comma or remove serial comma. I had never thought about it. <laughs> it's a good question. I should try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rewrite uh, uh, the following piece of text using the serial comma. Uh, that would be an interesting uh, one to ask. But I'm quite sure. I mean, you know, from seeing what ChatGPT can do, we'll soon have really good tools. Uh, you take a subscription. You send your manuscript, you know, it sends you back you know, a clean version of your manuscript, much more readable. And so, yeah, uh, what will the, the impact be? I think not, not gigantic, but uh, but it's going to be very convenient if you can write a piece of text. The question is, you know, 
if you if you are not a great writer and you have this great tool that corrects everything for you, you know, you never really need to become a much better writer. And so that that is maybe a bit of a concern. I mean, there are you know difficulties that let's say if you come from you speak a Slavic language, you'll struggle with D versus A. Okay. Should I put A, D, or nothing in front of my word? Okay. People who speak Slavic languages, they struggle with that. Right. And so uh, normally they have to learn, okay, yeah, well, how does that work? And uh, uh, here you could say, well, I'll just give it to ChatGPT and it gives me the corrected version and I don't need to think about it. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not very sure. But I'm, I'm really curious. So uh, to, to summarize uh, here, yeah, really for me, it's really important <laughs> if you want to tell something to, to the reader. That's, if you start from that idea, even if you don't remember every single detail, but you really start from the idea that you want the person who reads what you're writing to understand as much as possible, that will already improve naturally uh, the quality of your writing. I'm sure some of you already do it, so I'm not, you know, this is not a judgment on, 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 on anyone. Uh, but, uh, you know, really thinking that there is someone on the other side who's going to read this and you want to explain something. All right, so that's what I wanted to, to say today. Maybe there are questions online. Uh, yes. Uh, Eve, are you familiar with uh, Grammarly? Yeah, yeah, I'm not super familiar, but yeah, that's, a, that's a, also a nice set of tools there. Yes. Do you use it? I, I do use it. Um, I use the free version. Of course, the, 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 the premium version is even better, but it's, you know, it's kind, I think it's like $15, $20 a month, but uh, it's really good. It's really good. And um, it does, you know, help you rewrite sentences. It, it points out places where you need to be more concise. You can specify the type of language you want, UK, language, UK English or US English. So, um, you know, and also, the nice thing about it is if you download it on your laptop, uh, it, it, you can use it like, for example, in PowerPoint, in uh, Outlook, in Word, it, it covers everything. So uh, so people, if they want to give it a try, I think that's something you know uh, worth taking a look at. Of course, if you look at it yourself, then you can give us a better, better feedback on what you think about it. Yeah. No, but I think people can try. Uh... Yeah, I've heard about it. I've never really used it, but I certainly have heard. Uh, I've about used it for for about two, three years now. I think even maybe longer. But, yeah. Okay, well, so that's good to know. And so there is a free version. Uh, yes, there is a free version. Um, if you look in the like the comparison between the versions, it'll tell you uh, you know what is uh, uh, what differences there is. Uh, the free version doesn't have like full sentence rewrites, but it does give you some, you know, it does uh, detect tone. Um, it does the it does do citations. Uh, so it's it's it, it's it's pretty complete, I think. Of course, okay. now Chat GPT is out there. But. Yeah, but I mean, they will you know, they will adapt their tools. I mean, so so it's, it's really the idea that 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 it is possible to do that. You know, almost automatically. Uh, that's really quite, uh, quite striking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I also have <clears throat> first. Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but anyway. So uh, first, I just wanted to comment that uh, because now fini finished just finished the manuscript with the chemist, and uh, you mentioned about uh, word and its uh, its um, nightmares uh, made, made made me very. Uh, happy about my um, yeah so uh, so uh, I just felt it now that word is, is quite uh, crazy so I may maybe I show your your um, video to the chemist uh, so with the with the um, uh, data set question for example I think there is the, there is a there's a question of this reference class that what exactly is the audience because in Neurips, I think everyone write it together, and now I just checked it, uh, and I had 
like open machine learning papers like four in my laptop and all of them write together so i think in this situation they kind of expect you to write together so yeah i don't know maybe in bioinformatics it's, it's written separately so maybe so in, in the case of of um Edward, maybe it's a good idea to write together because it's more like a machine learning thing. But, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, these things, I mean, the, the language is not something that is fixed, that will change over time. And so, there, I mean, people will have very strong opinions about things that will, you know, 10, 20 years later will be completely different. Yeah. I guess that's that's part of not, not being a science. I think that's it. Yeah, that's... yeah and, and the other thing, I, I'm not saying that these small things matter too much in that regard, but I, I'm sure that there are things in, in these conferences when they kind of identify you as outsider of the club or like the, the machine learning community when you use a different notation, I, maybe even the words is, but I have a strong feeling that actually kind of knowing that how that community in that specific conference like to put things help you to get accepted, which of course, as we, as you pointed out in the beginning, it shouldn't be the first uh, motivation in writing, but uh, sadly it can have significant. I'm not saying we shouldn't care. I mean, we need to yeah, care. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I think that the, the indeed, you know, if, if the, uh, there is a certain way of writing in a certain community and that might impact indeed uh, um, yeah, small details or larger, larger elements. Indeed, the risk that you are perceived as an outsider, that's always a big danger. I agree with that. And I know, yeah, in overly, if you write data sets, it gets, like, <coughs> it gets under, I mean, if you write data sets split in overly, yeah. it gets marked as a okay. error. You and see? it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I also use Grammarly, and it's not really good at integrating with overlay, so yeah. at least it yeah. wasn't if you want to. <coughs> Grammarly is mostly good for punctuation, yes. especially for common series. It's kind of common series as well. But not, I mean, it's not that. But if, that yeah, if you write it together, it. sorry, oh, you're right. Yeah. F is sort of pretty good. Yeah, then it's better. <laughs> So all the all the captions and the parentheses really um, like it confuses grammar. Yeah. But if I write uh, if I write just the motivation letter or something like that, I only write it on grammar. Yeah. All right. So nothing else left. Thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm sick, so can't go for for a drink today. <coughs> I don't want to, to uh, uh, <coughs> contaminate uh, people, uh, plus I'm just exhausted. All right, so uh, thanks everyone, uh, and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.